welcome to Faith in Haverhill. Time to talk about ministry, ethics, and current events. Uh, I'm your host, Pastor Rick Harrington. I'm the pastor right here in Haverhill at First Baptist Church, and I'm excited to have my next guest with me, Doug Gregan, the director of New Brothers Fellowship. Welcome, Doug. Thank you, Pastor Rick. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's great, it's great to, to have to be you. here. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, you to start by just talking a little bit about, tell us a little bit about yourself, personal life, uh, wife and kids, and yeah. um, maybe we'll get to how you came to know the Lord. So. Okay, very good. Well, uh, I am married. I have a wife, Caroline Gregan. Uh, I have a daughter, 25 years old. Her name is Hannah. She just got married this past year uh, in December. Congratulations. She's now pregnant with our first hey. grandchild. Right. So this is pretty exciting. It's this been a huge, huge year. Oh, uh, in, in terms of life events, this is pretty big. Okay. So we've been married 27 years. We've been in ministry together full time for the past 12 years. And uh, God has been really good to us. We're really, really blessed. Um, I don't know what I don't know what you, how much you want to dig into my past. Um, I can basically uh, I grew up in California, Southern California. I was born and raised there. Spent 20 years there. Left California to come to the East Coast as a saxophonist. I came to the Lord uh, through music, basically in kind of an odd way. Um, so yeah, I moved to the East Coast to study saxophone with someone privately here. My life basically kind of plummeted into uh, what I now call poverty of spirit, you know, mm -hmm. blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom. So my entry point to the kingdom was through that, that experience of coming out here, having no one, having nothing, and realizing that music wasn't going to get it done in terms of what I really needed in my life and my heart, you know. Do you still play the saxophone? Oh yeah, okay. yeah. I've been playing for over 35 years, um, and I love it. Every now and then, I get a gig at Cafe de Siena in Newburyport. Okay. I've played there twice now. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> so mostly jazz. It's jazz, jazz straight ahead. Jazz. Yeah, Excellent. that kind of thing. Good. So, um, Doug, did you grow up in a Christian home or a nominal Christian home? Or no, I grew up in a in a non-Christian home. My my mother very early on rejected her faith. She grew up in a, in, in a you know a Christian faith, a fundamental Christian faith. My father had nothing, uh, a Catholic mother, a father who just rejected God. So by the time I was three or four, my mother had stopped going to church, and uh, I was raised basically as an atheist, you know. The, the, my, on my mother's side in particular, there's a split right down the middle, half, some half Christian, half not. And uh, my mom joined the non-Christian side of things. So I was raised in, a, in, an, in an atheist, but basically what I call an atheist environment. Um, very, uh, we had no problem mocking my cousins, mocking Christians, you know, it was just kind of common. So it was an interesting, it was very interesting to have God confront that. Mm -hmm. um, I was thankful that he, that he did though, you know, it was good. Okay. And when did that happen? When you, when you moved from SoCal out here, you were a Christian at the time or you were still? I was not. You were not. I was not so saved. something happened while you were here. Is, can, you, can you give us the story of what yeah, happened? Yeah, man. <laughs> so the way I tell it is, you know, when you're in prison ministry, you're dealing with guys who lose everything all, all day long. Everyone you talk to, I've lost everything. And they really have. I mean, it's literal. So, but poverty of spirit comes in a lot of different ways. And for me, the way it came was through God giving me everything I wanted. I started playing saxophone in seventh grade. I just accelerated in, on that instrument. It really was a good fit for me. By the time I was in my second year, uh, third year of college, um, I was extremely proficient playing in big bands, Playboy Jazz Festival, uh, you know, it was, a, it, was, it was a great life, it's what I wanted, and so here I am, I'm on this trajectory to, to be a professional saxophonist, and I show up on the East Coast, and like I said, the way I describe it is God got me poor by giving me everything I wanted, and mm -hmm. said, now, how, how's it feel, you know, how you doing, and you realize, this isn't, you know, these, I'm studying with a, you know, a, a prominent East Coast saxophone player. I go to these lessons. I feel miserable when I leave. I don't want to practice. Everything was just falling apart. I'm hanging out with crazy people. I'm drinking more than I've ever, you know, I didn't drink a lot in my life. But for the, on that early days in Boston, I, I was drinking. And so it's like, there's something seriously wrong here. So that journey kind of, my, my wife played a big part in the culmination of this. Mm -hmm where, um, I'll try to keep it short, but the, the, the short version is, she wrote me a letter and said, you know, I'm telling her, I'm lonely out here, you know, I want you to come and be with me, you know, I feel so sad. 
And she says, the Lord had really done a work in her heart in, those, in, those, in, that, in a short period of time there. And she wrote me a letter and said, I'm not coming out there unless we're married. So I got angry. I said, all right. So we, st we stopped talking for four weeks. And so this is kind of the highlight, this four-week period where, well, she and my mother-in-law were praying for me uh, for the Spirit to do a work in my heart. That's exactly what God did. And one of my, my wife's prayer that really stuck out, which is... Which, absolutely was fulfilled was ever, that everything he sees cause him to think about you, cause him to think about God. And that's what happened everywhere I was going, man, on the bus. Well, you know, I'm in the middle of Cambridge. I worked in Cambridge, homeless people. And I was just like, what is going on? What is life about? So it really created that crisis for me. And four weeks later, I called her up and said, I need to know how to get saved. So, you know, she was raised a Christian, missionary parents. And so that's how... That kind of came to a head. 22 years old, got born again. Wow. Okay. And it was awesome. Yeah. It, was, it was dramatic, you know. Yeah. Put down my saxophone, gave my saxophone to the Lord, gave my music to the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, and there you have it. And then you gave it back, right? You, cause you said Absolutely. You, yeah, so yeah, man. You just needed a time away from the saxophone to... Yeah. Well, really God, I mean, you know, God has been... You know how God is, man. He's constantly sowing, constantly reaping, even when you think he's not doing anything with you. Yeah. So one of the things that God did in the early days of my, of my faith was he brought Keith Green. Uh, my, yeah. well, Keith Green, a lot, a lot of people know his ministry today. They know his music somewhat, but his ministry was a powerful ministry. And he shares in his testimony, the book that his wife wrote, he shares about how God called him to do the same thing, to lay your instrument down. He's, it's this idea of I've got to be the sanctifier. Your gifts and your talents are of no interest to me. It's, it's by my spirit, right? It's not, it has nothing to do with, with what you bring to the table. It's about who I am. So Keith Green went through that journey of letting his music go and then the Lord releasing him to pick it up again. And so I kind of did the same thing. It was a little shorter, but it was, uh, I'm glad I did it. Yeah. 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 Awesome. All right. And now you live here in Georgetown. We're in Georgetown. So you're yeah. neighboring Georgetown and you're in Haverhill a lot for different, different reasons. So. I am in Haverhill yeah. a lot. So yeah. in your plans to stay in the area? As far as I know, Sounds unless the Lord says something different, okay. we're here. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, when you, God began to work in your life out here, did you get plugged into a church right away, or was that something that happened a little later? As soon as we were married, I connected to... Uh, my wife has a, a deep history in the Assemblies of God, particularly the Spanish Assemblies. So Assembly of God was uh, the church that I looked for. You know, I got the, I got the order. You know, we're going to get married, so you go find the minister. Okay, so I, I went to an, the Assembly of God church that was around the corner from where I lived. Uh, that didn't, he didn't end up conducting our service, but Assemblies of God was what I was looking for. So we started there in the North End. We lived in the North End when we first got married. Okay. Um, we went there for about a year, and then God just began to do uh, some, some leading, bringing us into different relationships, and we ended up at what was a very independent and charismatic church, um, or what most people would consider very charismatic. Uh, the Christian Teaching and Worship Center out of uh, uh, Woburn is their, where they were okay. ultimately based. Um, and what a great, I'll tell you, it was, a, it was an excellent fit for us at the time. For the season we were there, it was an excellent, uh, the, the pastor there was a professional, a former professional violinist. So from a worship, you know, learning how to worship, learning how to worship on your instrument, all that that meant. I became a worship leader, so I lead worship, play key, keyboard and so forth. So all that experience was, was huge in terms of kind of forming things in me about what God would do later in my ministry. Okay, yeah. awesome. And now that you're here, you go to, is it New Life Christian Assembly? Is that where you go now, to church? We're, we're uh, New Life Christian Assembly is, is, I'll say that Pastor Rick is my, my covering, my pastoral covering. Okay. So we're not there at New Life as often as we'd like to be. Oh, okay. But yeah, that's, that, I would consider that my home church. Okay. And so um, Assemblies of God, for those who may not know, and that are listening and watching, um, is a Pentecostal and is charismatic. Uh, explain what that means to folks. Maybe, my guess is a lot of folks listening maybe have a uh, Roman Catholic background, perhaps, or uh, what is a Pentecostal charismatic? What would be the distinctives there, Doug, just to give them a All sense? All right. <laughs> well, I'll give you the, for me, the, the fundamental doctrines that stand out in a Pentecostal or an Assembly of God environment are the, the f firm belief and, and the, re the, re the realization of the gifts of the Spirit that are, that are given in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14. Those things are gifts given by the Spirit. 
The assemblies, of course, believe in uh, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. That second, uh, you know, there's different language that you can use there, but that second experience with the Holy Spirit where Christ says, hey, I'm going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that's foundational. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the assemblies of God believe in the evidence of speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. So you're, you, there's uh, the use of tongues in, in a personal way. There's use of tongues in a corporate way, right? So the, obviously there's order to that. And that's where I would find myself probably varying. If, uh, distinguishing myself from a charismatic point of view would be along the lines of order. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty firm believer in the order of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpretation, those things should be done in order. They're for the body. I absolutely, man, I, I, I love the fact that uh, the assemblies hold that, and I hold that personally, um, but there should be order, you know. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. And one thing I've noticed, uh, Doug, just kind of following you a little bit on Facebook and, and, and things, there's a real emphasis in your ministry um, on holiness. Uh, would you say that's true? Absolutely. On the pursuit of holiness. Yeah. Uh, where does that emphasis uh, come for from, from you? Why, that's a, that strong emphasis on the pursuit of holiness. And we'll talk about your ministry, of course, and how that yeah. relates to there. But. Well, I would answer that. I could, tie that into, um, I could tie that into the ministry by saying a lot of, I've never been in prison, right? So I'm in full-time prison ministry. I've been in prison ministry for 12 years. You say, well, why are you in prison ministry? Um, it's not because I'm an, I'm, I'm an evangelist by nature. I'm really not. I, my heart for the men and the women that we serve is spiritual maturity, Christian maturity. That's, that's, that is what I'm passionate about, both myself and my wife. So how do you end up in prison ministry? You end up in prison ministry or you end up equipped by God for prison ministry because in prison, what you're constantly dealing with is rebellion, failure, rejection of God, uh, despair, uh, frustration, you name it, right? It's just, it's a lot of darkness, a lot of sin, a lot of brokenness, a lot of brokenness. And so in my testimony, in my personal testimony, that's there. Um, after coming to a faith in Christ, I, uh, I came into my relationship with Christ with a huge history of pornography and sexual sin in my life. So that working through that in Christ was tough. It was, it was grueling. Uh, obviously, um, personally, it was grueling. Re uh, maritally, you know, my marriage, my wife. I mean, you know, my wife and I came to a point where uh, she just, uh, the only reason I mentioned this is because she recently recounted it to someone that she was ministering to was you reach a point where you're like, am I even, was I ever even saved? You know, did I even know who Christ was? You're just going through the, the, the motions of, you know, doing this, you know, because Christian life is pretty easy to pick up on. You can, you can witness that in jail. A guy can, come, a guy can come to chapel, watch men worship, and begin to worship. It's pretty easy to do. You pick up the language, you pick up the, the, the motions, the gestures, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, but what is, is, who is Christ to you? That's the reality. So Christ, working through who Christ is, humbling, breaking through. A, I'm, I'm such a rebellious man, Rick. I don't have time to tell you of how rebellious I have been in my Christian life, particularly in that area of lust and sexual sin. So, um, so now, being, now being delivered from that, being free of that, continuing to walk and pursue God and, and asking Him and, and really constantly asking the Holy Spirit to, to deal with my heart. Um, that's where you're finding that language, that, that, that focus of um, Christ died, right? In, in uh, Romans 5, 21 says that, uh, um, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm quoting, I'm trying to quote <laughs> scripture on, on television. It, it talks about sin, just as sin reigned unto death, so grace reigns through righteousness. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the key. Grace, grace, by grace are you saved through faith, Right. But for what purpose? For what end? Grace reigns through righteousness. And it's that. That's where you want peace, right? Is your, is your life falling apart? Are you an addict? Are you in despair? Are you desperate? Righteousness is the answer to that. It's found in Christ. His imputed righteousness, the righteousness that he gives freely by grace. But, but you are called to be in agreement 
with righteousness, right? So that's, that's uh, one of the things I minister all the time is that, is are you in agreement with the work of the Holy Spirit, which is to form Christ in you? That's a, that's a big part of my and our ministry. You know, I'm thinking, uh, Doug, as people are listening to you, I'm sure there's a lot of guys uh, thinking, wow, first of all, the minister just talked about his own struggles, sexual, you know, with pornography. Yeah. And a lot of guys are probably thinking how refreshing to know, to see that type of honesty, that transparency. And I would imagine in prison ministry, we'll get more to it and talk about it later, that you got to be clear and open um, about sin and the struggles because these guys, they need hope, they need grace. Yeah. Um, but before I get to, to talk more about prison ministry, um, we, you know, on the show, we've had all different types of, of, of pastors and missionaries, and some of them come on with, uh, you know, PhDs and MDivs, some of them with no formal education, uh, but all of them seem to have a real good grasp of the scriptures. So how did you learn the Bible? Doug, was it, was it uh, did you go to any formal schooling? Did you learn it from mentors? I've taken some Bible classes. I am, I am, uh, I am as unseminaried as uh, maybe anyone who's ever sat in a chair so far. Um, so I'm definitely... Uh, 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 what most people would call a lay minister. I'm a, I'm a reverend, you know, through the assemblies, through a local commission. But, but outside of that, everything, my knowledge of the scripture, my knowledge of the word has come through that pressing in. Now, when I got saved, God did a wonderful work in my life by giving me a hunger for the word. That was definitely a work that he did. So I, would, I was constantly, I had this little pocket Bible I got from my mother-in-law, and I was just in it all the time, underlining, reading, soaking it in. And then another thing that happened that, I, that stands out for me in terms of answering that question is there was a minister, uh, Roland Kimball. He was a minister in the assemblies. He ministered out of uh, New Hampshire. He ended up at our home church of Exeter Assembly of God, where I spent a lot of time. I spent so, over seven years there. Um, and Roland Kimball was a guy who, he was a, an older man. Man, he knew the word inside and out. And his ministry, when he would minister from the pulpit, that was his ministry, just the word leading to the word leading to the word. He just constantly ministered that way. So I'll, I'll never, there was a, a particular day he was ministering and I was just blown over listening to this guy preach the word with the word. And I prayed and I asked God, I said, Lord, I, I want to do that. So I've been taking the word in and, you know, by the mercy of God, as it is for everybody, obviously, but um, it just has been coming out ever since. So I think God is still fulfilling that prayer, but uh, I feel like in, in some ways he has fulfilled it. So that, that's, it's just that, just that understanding that I can't live without this. You know, man lives not by bread alone, every word that proceeds out of his mouth. And in, certainly in my battle against sin, um, man, I, I, I can't do without the word. I, that, that's it. And that's, that's, that's huge in, in the ministry of New Brothers. You know, if you... If you come to, you know, we're not talking about it yet, but if you come on Thursday to a New Brothers meeting, mm -hmm. you're, get, you're getting that all the time. Are you in the Word of God? Mm -hmm. So Good. Yeah. Uh, I read that uh, you sort of got your, 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 your feet in the door of prison ministry working with uh, Chaplain Ray. That's right. Yeah, tell us about, tell us about that. Some folks might be familiar with, Cha with Ray. Well, Ray yeah. Perez is yeah. definitely, uh, he's still a presence in the community, and he's been gone for 10 years, I think, <laughs> now. Uh, so he was quite a character, you know, quite a presence, a very, very present man, a charismatic man. Um, yeah, what a gift that was that God brought me to him. I got laid off from Verizon in 2003. Uh, I had no idea what I was going to do, but at that time I did offer him. I, I just told God, I said, all right, here I am. I got no job. I'm, I'll do whatever you want. I had a worship band at the time. We were, I was looking for opportunities to worship, and so uh, a friend recommended that I connect to Ray and so we ended up ministering at the, the Lawrence Correctional Alternative Center, that, the pre-release, the smaller jail in Lawrence. Sometimes and called the farm. Called the farm, yeah, yeah. yeah. So from that night, God did a work. You know, prison ministry is kind of an odd thing. Most people who are in it will tell you, I wasn't looking for it, but when I found mm -hmm. it, I knew that God had put that desire in me. They call it the, the bug, you know. So... Um, that night, God did a work in my heart, and uh, I just told Ray, look, I'm free. You know, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll help out. I'll, I'll come. And so that's what happened. I kind of became assistant volunteer chaplain, and things just progressed from there. He was, he was definitely a mentor in my life without, without question. A solid year of sitting under his ministry was, was really powerful in, in, in uh, establishing, you know, obviously prison ministry, but also Christ, our relationship with Christ. He had a great walk with the Lord, you know. Yeah. 
Still does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so now your role is the, is the director of New Brothers Fellowship, sometimes called NBF. That's right. right so tell us, tell us about, uh, a little bit about NBF. Okay, so New Brothers Fellowship is a prison, a prison and prison aftercare ministry. It's primarily an aftercare ministry. We support men coming out of correctional facilities in Essex County, but also Massachusetts. Anyone coming from any correctional facility. And then we have a partner ministry for women called New Beginnings for Women, which is a ministry directed towards any woman who's been touched by corrections. And that's a, that's a powerful statement. Um, so New Brothers Fellowship, we have two fundamental things that we do, and that is connect men to the body of Christ. You have to be connected to the body of Christ. If you're, if you're a man who's coming out of jail, you've got to get connected to a local church, period. All right? Don't try to dance around it. Just do it. Find a church and submit to that pastor and learn how to walk with God. So that's huge. Um, and then the second thing is we, we're obviously just in, in the ministry of discipling. We disciple men. And so the discipleship groups that we run, they're every week, consistent uh, 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 opportunities for guys to come and fellowship with other men of God, men who are, have come out of jail, yes, but also more, more equally important, men who are in Christ, who are from the local body. And so God's done a great work. You know, we started these discipleship groups, which we now have, I should know, have the number right off the top of my head. I'm going to say that we have eight um, discipleship groups that are in place right now every week. We started with three. I was running all of those, and uh, that was great. Um, but the great thing about the ministry is it's, it's also a call for the body of Christ to respond to prison ministry, for the body of Christ to step up and, and receive these men and these women in, right where they are and long suffer with them and walk with them because that's tough. And that's the, that's the unique quality of, of, of New Brothers is we're, we walk with men in places where a lot of pastors can't because they have a lot of responsibility. And, and so we like to partner with pastors in that sense. And, you know, we're, in, in other words, we're, we're people taking phone calls at one in the morning. We're people going out and, you know, there have been times when I, uh, I've been in the city of Lynn chasing after someone who had stolen some, some poor woman's car because his because her boyfriend was in a crack house using, you know, crazy stuff. So I try not to do that anymore. But nonetheless, the ministry kind of takes that, that quality. We're, we're committed to these men and these women in places where, um, where sometimes they're not receiving anything else. And that's a powerful thing, man. These guys, they, they know we're committed to them. And that's the work of God, in, not only in us, in Carolina and myself as the directors, but um, and the volunteers that we serve, just amazing people who really love the guys that they serve, the women they serve, you know? Yeah, yeah. one of the, the branches, um, it meets at First Baptist, the right. church I'm pastoring at, and it's just like you said, you get in, getting the body of Christ involved because it's led by a guy who's a member at First Baptist, who is actually um, kind of training up a guy who is another member, a newer member there. Right. So you can kind of see, the, like you are saying, that the, the, the involvement of the local church and that connection um, you know, it's, I think you're right, Doug, that it's so easy to kind of look at it as a sep something separate from the local church when you have already this, the, the built-in, God-ordained ministry right there for them, which is the body of Christ, That's which right. has all that diversity that it needs. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, you, you had mentioned that uh, on the, the women's ministry of it uh, that has been touched by the correctional um, institution. Explain that, what that means. Okay, so um, obviously there are women coming out of correctional facilities in, in the region, for the most part, we haven't, we've, made, uh, we've made attempts at connecting with those women, and at this point, the ministry is not reaching them for whatever reason. So the women that, that my wife, that Caroline is ministering to frequently, uh, for the group that we have right now, the core group we have is in Haverhill. Uh, we meet up at the Assembly of God Church, you know, Rick's Church in, uh, on Main Street. That ministry is attended by women uh, who have husbands who are in jail, boyfriends who are in jail, or guys who are out of jail and either, you know in relationship with me or new brothers, or have or are just struggling and out you know doing their own thing and they're just alone you know so the stories look different, but when you say touched by corrections, there are women sitting in churches everywhere in your church. I guarantee you there are women in your church every Sunday that you don't know have either someone in their family in their uh, relationally incarcerated. It's, it's a huge problem. And there's such shame. You know, when you're, these, these women, uh, 
You know, I, 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 Caroline tells this story often about women who, you know, you want to, you know, if, if the Lord's moving in a particular service, let's say you're, you're at, a, at, a, at a church and there's an altar call for prayer. You know, once you come up, let's, we want to pray for you. As soon as that woman gets out of her chair, if her husband's in jail, every, the, the thought that going through her head is, I know everyone's thinking, you know, oh, you know, he's screwing up again. You know, it's that whole idea, such a shame-based uh, uh, oppression. And it's not necessarily true, but that's certainly how we feel. And then you find, unfortunately, that there are congregations and are places where, for whatever reason, man, they're not equipped to minister to that population. And so what happens is now you're hurting people, and that's tragic, very frustrating. You know, you had mentioned the aftercare um, um, so after guys, you, you, you know, part of the ministry has been in the past, we'll talk more about it, is going into the prisons, but that aftercare, when guys get out, um, you know, former inmates come out, um, that's a crucial time. Um, right. And I've, I've heard from, from a lot of New Brothers folks, why is that such a crucial time, that the, 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 the months, the weeks and months after they get out? There's a couple different factors. The, the to simplify, one is, because a man who's been incarcerated has lost everything, the first order of business is you, you got to start getting things back. And that's high pressure. Because you can't engage in the world without some fundamental things. You can't, if you don't have an ID, you can't apply for a job. You can't, you know, you can't, there, there's different transactions you can't um, fulfill and so forth. So identification, transportation, uh, medical care, you name it, man. There's all these pressures. And then you've got, if, you, if you're on parole, you're on probation. Now you've got someone who's checking up on you, giving you urines. Uh, some, many men are, countless men are mandated with all, a, a litany of programming. You know, you got to be here on this day. You got to be here on that day. Here's your, your urine color. It's, it's a madhouse. I mean, these guys are up against it. I'm telling you, the, these men coming out of jail, whether they're Christians or not, they got to jump through a lot of hoops. It's tough. And so then you add that spiritual component, which is most of these guys, many of them have, have never been a Christian before, or they've never really engaged with the body of Christ. So there's a lot of trepidation, a lot of unknown. Or they've been to jail many times or multiple times as Christians, and now they're coming out again, and it's like, am I gonna, is this going to work this time? Am I going to succeed? Am I going to end up here again? So regardless of how you're coming out, that's a lot of weight. Right? Am I going to be able to stay with Christ? Am I going to be able to stay close and, and find victory, walk in victory? So it, it's, uh, it's very difficult, a lot of pressure. And so, yeah, obviously the ministry's goal is find us, you know, connect to us. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's, it's vital. I hope that answered your question. Does, yeah, definitely. And, I've, you know, I've heard that the temptation too, Doug, of going back to those old friends, going back to that old life that you went into beforehand, it's just right there in front of you. And as if the decision you know, is right there, do I go back to this life, go back to drugs, go back to these same group of friends that were, I was getting in trouble with before, or do I keep going in this new direction? And that, that, those first few months are gonna be crucial and kind of decide, I mean, it's gonna be an ongoing struggle, but those first few months are gonna be particularly crucial, I think, for someone who comes out. Absolutely. Yeah. And depending on where you are in your relationship with the Lord and how mature you are, uh, certainly first-time believers, guys who have received Christ inside, um, that first time out, man, they're really up against that particular issue, that idea of, that, that, that issue of temptation. Because really all you know, the only person, the only Christian you know is the minister you've been hanging out with. So if you've been going to one or two services a week, um, and they're the only ministry you know, now you're leaving, even if you, even if he calls, even if I call someone right out of the gate, that's not, you're, you're talking about one man, one friendship or one relationship against countless, yeah. right? And like you said, none of them are healthy. Yeah. Most of, even uh, uh, a lot of guys are struggling with uh, relationships that are not healthy. You got to cut this off. This woman's, you know, I'm sorry to say it, but you know, this woman's killing you. Mm -hmm. This is not a healthy relationship. There's, there's no profit. There's no benefit to your spirit here. She needs the Lord. You need the Lord. What you need to do is settle down and learn how, you know, get, get established in your own walk with Christ. So that, that's a huge, huge battle. Mm -hmm. 
Doug, how many churches would you say that New Brothers is working with, the both sides, men's and women's? Well, uh, we're probably, I mean, every, every meeting that we have, with the exception of two, with the exception of three, are, are in, are taking place in churches. In church, yeah. All right, so that's five right there. Um, and then obviously, relationally, we're in relationship with probably 12 or 15 different churches that we consistently relate to and communicate with. You know, yeah. We're missionaries, so our support is rooted in, in the body of Christ, local, you know, indiv individuals and uh, churches who support us. Okay. So that, that's a huge thing for us is that missions piece. Okay. And do you find, uh, you kind of referred to a little bit that churches, um, how, do, how do they do with having New Brothers guys come and join them? You said some churches struggle with that. They don't, they don't know how to minister to these guys. Um, so I'll give you an example. One of, the, one of the best comments, one of the most encouraging comments I heard at First Baptist is uh, one of the New Brothers guys said that uh, we feel is so welcomed here on Sundays. Nobody looks down at us. Nobody looks at us differently that we're part of this church. Uh, is that the norm? Have you found that churches have been very good with New Brothers, folks that are getting involved in New Brothers, or has there been a, a kind of a learning curve there for churches? There's definitely a learning curve. Mm -hmm. The key is the key is, is endurance. Can you endure with a man? In other words, most churches are very welcoming, which is awesome. They, they, need, they, should, they need to be, they should be. What, what you find is the pressure really starts hitting when a man starts struggling. Mm -hmm. So here you've invested in, a, in an individual to, some, to whatever degree, you as a pastor, maybe th that man has uh, entered into some relationships, they're supporting him, helping him, and then he disappears, or he steals from them, or he commits a crime. That kind of stuff weighs heavy on the body. And that's where you, you, you can find, you really kind of, <laughs> you, you get to test the quality of, of the minister, Right? I've, I've seen ministers get discouraged by guys who just continue to fail, and I've seen them throw up their hands and say, you know what, I'm, I don't know what to do anymore, I'm done. So it, it runs the full spectrum. Uh, and so those are the two sides. Welcoming is huge, right? What is prison ministry, we used to you know, we, we say to people? What, is it, what does it mean to participate in New Brothers? Do you need some special skill? Do you need to have some special call, some special gift? No, all you need to do is be able to shake a guy's hand and say, I'm so glad you're here. Mm -hmm. Guys, they love that, man. That's huge. Yeah. When you're inside, what, 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 what makes a powerful ministry? Sincerity and love. Uh, you, you know, ge a genuine person, like you said, you referred back to my testimony. Um, man, guys will read right through you. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll rip you to shreds. They, they know whether you're fooling or not. So all of that is, is, is huge. And, uh, you know, your church is just fantastic. Guys are plugging into your church uh, left and right. And, you know, not everyone stays, and that's right. okay. Mm -hmm. we, we, we grow, you know, we, 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 we move. But nonetheless, your church is fulfilling that role of what a new brother needs. Mm -hmm. So thank, thank you. Yeah, no, hey, thank you, Doug. It's been a blessing to us. It really has. Yeah. In fact, there are folks uh, from our church who joined the New Brothers uh, Bible study um, who have, don't, have never been to prison because they love the honesty and the openness yeah, and the man. realness of these guys. Yeah. And so they've been blessed just to say, hey, go sit in with these guys and, and just be part of that. Just yep. watch what, what happens there. So Yeah, it's, it is awesome, yeah. especially when that happens. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, a big part of New Brothers in the past has been to go into prisons and do prison ministry, uh, you know, run a service in, in the prisons. And that still happens to some degree, we can talk about. But things have kind of changed in that area, Doug. Can you kind of expl explain sure. what's happened there? Yeah, well, I, when I started with Ray, by 2004, I was assistant chaplain. Uh, Ray left 2007. Uh, I remained involved as, a, as an assistant chaplain under another chaplain who was there for a few years. And then in 2009, I just, I became the, ch the, the Protestant chaplain for the, for the county. So those two jails, the Middleton Correctional Facility, Lawrence Correctional Alternative Center, those two facilities, I served from 2009 uh, for two years, I served as a volunteer, no stipend, no compensation. So I just, I, don't, I went in for free and, and supported the county that way. Um, and then I, I got a stipend. I, I, I want to say that uh, prison ministry is an amazing thing. You, I, I would love to encourage you to encourage your men to feel that out, you know. I mean, you know, Frank is a, just a, a, an amazing He's, he's so well-suited for that, 
for that ministry, that type of ministry. Frank is a member at Frank, First Baptist. Frank made a member, yep. member of First Baptist. Yep. So he's the leader of the Haverhill Discipleship Group. Great guy. He has that just that right heart, that right, those components that just fit. Guys identify with that. Um, so prison ministry for me was chaplaincy. Um, we, God was good during the time that I served there. We had, by the time I, I finished, we had over 30 services a week that guys could participate in. That's far more, I can just say it plainly, that's far more than any state facility that I know of in, in Massachusetts. 30 services a week that guys could plug into. So uh, it was a huge blessing. I, um, the Lord allowed me to start uh, some discipleship ministry, kind of intensive discipleship ministry. What was, uh, played a huge part in uh, maturing men and really settling men into their relationship with Christ. So I did that from, from 2009 until 2015, November 2015. And uh, I, you know, I ended up losing that position, uh, as we were talking about before we started here today, just through... Um, uh, that f a fundamental disagreement with the with protecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That that's how I'll kind of sum that up. You know, there's not everyone who comes into jail is preaching the gospel. Not everyone who, and this is a controversial thing to say, but not everyone who calls themselves a Christian is a Christian, as we under, as the Scripture reveals sure. who a believer in Christ is. So that issue came to a head during the last year and it, it, it basically ended in my, termina <laughs> in my termination. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, you mentioned beforehand, before the, before the camera started rolling, Doug, yeah. that's allowed you to focus more on the aftercare uh, in, a, in a way that you haven't been able to do in the past, which has really been a, a blessing. So. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for Caroline and I, navigating the loss of chaplaincy mm -hmm. was difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, on a personal level, you know, you, I mean, talk about investment. You're invested. I mean, I was in there, I had three two-hour worship services, two four-hour um, discipling uh, groups and so forth. So it was very focused, very intense. You're emotionally invested in there. And now you lose that. So navigating the loss of that has been tough. But one of the things that, as you just mentioned, that we've clearly seen a release now is, first of all, Caroline and I coming together more to minister more comprehensively to both sides of those relationships, which is huge, because guys don't know how to be married. They don't know how to minister mercy to their wives, care for their wives. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of selfish people are, I'm talking about myself, Doug Gregan is a selfish man. He's an ugly man, mm -hmm. just straight up. All right. So that's what you're, you know, now we're able to minister in a more direct way to the men and women uh, connected to the ministry and what a what a blessing it's been. We've seen some real growth in in uh, in people. It's it's awesome. Good. Good. You know, it's interesting, uh, uh, Doug. Uh, a couple interviews back, I uh, interviewed someone who had spent some time in the Navy in the Marine. He was in the Marines. Yeah. And asked about Navy chaplains, and he said, you know, be be praying for Navy chaplains because there's this strong pressure to be to kind of let go of the exclusivity of the gospel. Right. And, and just be more generalized. And I think that's the same thing where you you, know, you kind of struggle with here with prisons. Um, you think that's going to be, seems like it's becoming more and more of a, a push in general within prison ministry that, that the idea of, of evangelical Christianity um, is being more pushed out of the prisons. Do you think that's going to be more and more of an issue going forward? Oh, I would, I would say absolutely so. Um, I, in, in the course of my losing my position, one of the last things that was spoken to me by an administrator was that I was called intolerant for wanting to protect the Protestant chaplaincy and the volunteers. You know, we had over 100 volunteers serving um, serving in that capacity. So I felt a, a, a very strong obligation to protect and preserve the Protestant chaplaincy and keep it uh, true to the gospel, you know. So you're absolutely right that the state has already tried to uh, do away with chaplains, create an, an, an inner, what they call an interfaith model, an interfaith, interfaith ministry is huge right now. That's really what's because it's this, it's the idea of, you know, you do what you're going to do, but everything's touched. Everything is about authority. So everything, when you come under that authority of what's interfaith, you're going to be mandated to. It's going to happen. And that's what I was up against, and I've seen it happen, obviously, in the state. So the state, the DOC has already tried to eliminate chaplains at some point. And th by the grace of God, thank God uh, that people spoke up and that didn't happen. 
So um, it's, it's, it is absolutely on the rise, on the increase. Yeah. Um, and in the military, more than anywhere else, I think. I mean, based on what, you're, what you just shared, so, yeah, we had a, it's, that's a huge yeah. issue. He was a captain in the Marines. So. It started there, I think, that, that oppression of the gospel started in, in mil against military chaplains. Chaplaincy is invisible. People don't, people don't think about chaplains. Mm -hmm. The church doesn't think about chaplains. When was the last time you thought about state chaplains? You know, think about it. You, we, they're invisible men. I, I, I was thankful. I'm so thankful to have been in relationship with these guys, and I'm thankful to be able to spotlight who they are now with you, that there are just men and women pouring their lives into these men and women who are incarcerated. They're, I mean, they're just pouring themselves out. It's a powerful ministry, but it's an invisible ministry. Yeah. So thank God for those, those guys, those men and women who are serving out there. Absolutely, yeah. You know, in the off chance that someone who's involved in the correctional facility is listening, you know, I just, just want to say that uh, the effect of chaplains has, uh, who, who really preach the gospel is enormous. Yeah, and is. Um, you, know, you see lives transformed. I've watched it as a local church pastor. Lives transformed from people coming from a life of crime and sin to yeah. who are transformed by this good news. And it can, can only be good uh, for, our, right. for our society. Yeah. Uh, a number of questions about prison ministry. I think folks listening and viewing might uh, be interested in, okay. in, in learning about um, Doug. So this is, you know, the prison, your time, you've, your experience that you've spent within prison doing, doing services and things like that within the prison and the aftercare ministry. Yeah. Um, one is, uh, have you found that it's in some sense easier to minister to inmates or ex-inmates, former inmates, because you don't have to convince them that they're sinners, <laughs> that they know it. The society has already labeled them. It's been, they've made it very clear. These are derelicts. These are, these are people who have caused problems. That, that, you know, part of sharing the gospel is recognizing our own sinfulness and need of a Savior. Right. Do you find, in some ways, that's a little easier doing prison ministry? I find that I've been surprised that it wasn't. Really? So, okay. Interesting. Um, so again, there, there are two sides to that. You, what you're saying is true. Mm -hmm. Men, a man who's lost everything, you really see it in guys who have never been incarcerated before. Wow. You, I mean, you want to talk about whether they're young or old. You can, to see a man tremble at the reality of where their choice is and their sin, like you said, that's tough, man. And so there is a, a, definitely an, an openness there. What, what you do find a lot in jail, though, is because the recidivism rate is, is high, guys become hard. It actually becomes very easy to go to jail. I, I, know, guys who, I know guys who will winter in jail because they're kind of, you know, they kind of live a homeless lifestyle. So you're up against all kind of crazy thinking. You know, it's, it's, it's thinking that's broken. It's not normal. And incarceration by its nature fosters that right you get used to it you you it's a you know uh, there's a there's, I can't think of the term right now for it but uh, the, um, institutionalized mm -hmm. thinking um, and it has different degrees some men are you know if you do a lot of years it's tough but if you do a lot of years in short these are little short burst bids the same thing happens to you so those are the guys when you you know you get a lot of those guys coming to your service and what you find is a lot of guys who say yeah I, I know that I've heard that but there's no genuine relationship with, with the Lord, you know. A lot of Christian language, a lot of Christian talk, guys who will quote the, the Bible to you all day long, man. There's some guys know the Bible inside and out, but they're, it has no authority in their life. It has no, the, the power of the Spirit to empower them to fulfill and live that um, is, not, is nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really tragic when you see a guy who knows the Word, who has a, you know, a form of godliness but denies the power thereof, that kind of thing. That's, that's tough. So you're ministering to all those different flavors in answer to your question. Good, good, good. Um, one question I'm sure a lot of folks uh, have, because uh, I've heard this question in, in relation to working with uh, folks who come out of prison. Uh, what about sex offenders? What about pedophiles? Are you saying that there can be mercy for them? Oh, yeah. Amen. <laughs> one of the greatest privileges I had uh, was to just a, a quick testimony about I got a I received a phone call. I don't even remember who the who initiated the phone call, but I I got a call to go up to the infirmary and visit a man. The man was a sex offender. I sat down with that man. That man, as you said, was poor in spirit, man. He was broken. And we sat together for an hour, and when we were done, I led him to the Lord. And he's still incarcerated today, but he's walking strong with Christ. That 
is the power of God. And I know that man will, will succeed. I know that Christ will keep him because he doesn't trust in himself. He trusts in the Lord. So um, redemption, there's nothing that the gospel can't touch, right? Yeah. You and I absolutely are, are committed to that understanding. I'm committed to it because I've lived it. So praise God for that. Yeah, there's mercy. Um, is, it a, is it a difficult thing? As a prison minister, it's easy to minister to those. But as a man who's been incarcerated for that, that's tough. Coming out back into society, depending on your classification, there's a lot of different subtleties to that. They have different levels of classification, um, different uh, mandates in terms of who you have to report to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, where you can live, where you can't live. Can you live within X number of feet of a, you know, of a particular uh, type of public uh, building? Man, you, you talk about some difficult terms. One thing for an addict to come out of jail, it's a whole other ball game for a sex offender to come out of jail. It is really tough. Body of Christ, really tough. Mm. You, you want to, <laughs> if you think it's hard to find a church where a guy can grow just coming out of normal jail terms, try to find a church where a guy can grow as a former sex offender. That's tough. Yeah. That brings me to the next question that I think oftentimes you hear, and that is, what about issues of uh, safety and security? People would say, you know, as far as having guys who, have, who are former inmates coming to your church, uh, they're concerned about uh, the safety of the people there, safety of the kids. Um, any, any word of advice to churches who are, who are uh, a little hesitant, they're, they're concerned about this, you know? The, one of the focal points of our ministry, my ministry personally, is spiritual authority. If a man doesn't understand spiritual authority, the need to submit to the authority of Christ first, of the Word and the Holy Spirit, and of ministers, or pastor, particularly pastoral authority, other ministers that God brings into that man's life, that man will not grow. You have to be able to submit to the authority of a pastor. So how does, how does a pastor navigate that? He navigates it from that standpoint. From the standpoint of, are you, are you in faith able to open up to me and share trusting that God is going to bring us into a relationship that's going to benefit you, right? You, you know the love of God. You know the grace of God. You know how to minister truth to a man. If a man will submit to that love, that mercy, that truth, that man will flourish. So the challenge is, is for a man, a, a pastor can tell very quickly how a man responds to that issue of authority. Number one, if a pastor finds out that a man is a, a sex offender or, or even any offender, kind of on, by, you know, through the grapevine, that's not, really, that's not really a solid evidence of where that man is at. That man should come to a pastor and say, you know, particularly, I'm talking about a man who's found a church where he wants to grow. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying a guy should walk into a church door and say, hey, guess what? Guess who I am? We're talking about, you know, I, I want to grow here. That man sh should come to, a, to the pastor and say, this is who I want to, I want to sit with you. I want to share my life with you because I found something here that, that I'm, bear, that's bearing good fruit, right? So as that's a, a clear sign of where a man's at and, um, and the pastor can weigh that response to correction, you know, how do, how do you deal with discipline? How do you deal with terms and parameters that are set in place? Depending on what your offense was, there should be parameters for who you're able to interact with, what, you're, what ministries you're able to serve in. You shouldn't, it shouldn't be to the point of, of that you're crushing somebody, but there, you know, safety, is, safety of the body is huge, man. You're a shepherd. You've got to watch out for, for everyone. At the same time, the body needs to be enlarged in faith to say, we believe that Christ in you can release you, you know, it can, that, that grace in you, Christ in you, can release you to be a profitable, uh, fruitful member of our faith community. So, good. two sides, man. Yep, definitely. Good, good. I mean, what, you know, one thing we do at First Baptist, if somebody has any, has a, uh, any type of sex offense background, um, um, children's ministry is not for them. <laughs> and that's to protect them. Right. In some ways, for any accusation, anything, because any little thing, they're automatically going to yep. be under a microscope, and it's to protect the church. And and uh, but but absolutely, grace and and being involved in flourishing, you know, that's what we, we want to see happen there. Amen. So that's great. Um, do you find that that prison ministry um, can be a, a 
I mean, you're, you're a light in a dark place. Uh, um, I, I, knew a guy, I know a guy that's, who's, a, who's even now a member of our church, but he's serving a life sentence mm. uh, for something he did when he was like 20. Um, he was involved in an armed robbery. Uh, the guy he was with shot and killed someone during the robbery. He got charged as a, uh, with uh, murder, and so he, but he became a Christian later on. And you know, one of the things we go back and forth by phone call and letter is just everyone around him is a sociopathic or is a criminal. I mean, it's just it's a dark place to yeah. be. Um, so just having that be your whole ministry, uh, Doug, has that, have you found it to be just a, just a dark place to be? And you're, you're called to be a light in that dark place. Just, just speak to that a little bit for us. Well, is, are you asking, is it, is it a weight? Is there, is there, a, is there a, cha- a challenge to that? Yes. There, it's spiritual warfare all mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, in my, in my own life and in my own personal struggles, those are pressing, those, depending on where I've been in the, the time that I've been serving, depending, you know, my own personal life weighed against my ministerial life, those things are constantly coming assaulting me, assaulting my family, assaulting my marriage. So is it, is it, is it tough? Absolutely. So the, the key to it is resting, again, not in your own authority, but knowing you go in the authority of Christ. That's the place of safety, because if you belong to the Lord, you have nothing to fear, right? Uh, so I would say that God has, over time, I mean, Ray established that for me very early on. That was huge. To, the, just that idea that you're, you're not here in your own authority. God has called you here. So go boldly, you know, not in arrogance, but go boldly in Christ. And um, so I've gone through my own levels and layers of learning how to do that. So I would say, yeah, it's, it's tough. And you can see that's, that's how you know someone's not a good fit for prison ministry because they can't handle the weight. It's too much. Yeah, it's too much. <laughs> it really yeah, is. Yeah, it's pretty that. obvious. Good. Yeah. Now, I'm sure you're aware that uh, not just Haverhill, but the Merrimack Valley and, and really a lot of New England here is really uh, the heroin issue has been huge. Yeah. So do you find a lot of folks who are struggling with drug issues? I mean, that, that's their crime. That's what they've been locked up for. And what is, uh, what's it like trying to bear with someone as they fall back into addiction and then out of it, and back in and out of it? Has that become, um, you kind of s- said earlier, Doug, that people just, the churches need to have patience and perseverance because this isn't a, you know, a, a, a one night 180 all the time. A lot of times it's a long process of change. So. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, that issue of long suffering and enduring with men and women uh, is huge. When I minister to a man who's finding himself um, struggling with that, with that cycle, um, the, the key is vision casting, making sure that their focus is not on their addiction. You, you can waste a lot of time getting, being focused on your failure, being focused on your addiction. One of the things fundamentally that I share all the time is you, you've got your poster sins, and if you spend your life dealing with your poster sins, you're, you're going to fail. You're destined to fail. The, the Scripture says if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. So that's, that's your focal point, right? Stay in Christ. Focus on Him. Who is He? Who is the Holy Spirit? Allow the Word to establish you there. So that's big. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and say also in answer to that is men in particular have to come to the place that they understand what the work of the Holy Spirit is. Romans 8.28, everyone loves Romans 8.28, you know. Um, for whom he did, uh, I'm sorry, uh, all, for we know that God works all things together for good to those that love him that are called according to his purpose. But Romans 8.29 is, for whom he did foreknow, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's the work that you have to be in agreement with. And the man who's struggling with that cycle has, that to me is consistently his primary battle. It's one of being in agreement with Christ's likeness. Because you, because it's always about stuff, you know, well, she said that, or I got to go do this, and I lost my job, and it, it, it becomes, you get bogged down and weighed down with the stuff. That's not what it's about. It's are you in agreement with the work of the Holy Spirit to form Christ in you? If you are, Christ will lead you well. The Spirit will fulfill that work. So it, it's, uh, to me, it's, our ministry is, is often just about constantly redirecting 
men, women, back to that focal point. Focus on him, you know? I hope that makes sense. I hope I explained that well. Very good. Very good. Well, what would you say, Doug, to someone who says, you know, I've been really wanting to get involved in prison ministry? Uh, What's the first step? Where should they go from here? Well, in in our local community, that's tough right now because the, the jail still has not replaced the Protestant chaplain. There's no Protestant chaplain in the jail right now. So I can't even direct them to a particular individual. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's difficult. I would say, talk to me. Okay, call, I, talk you, to, call you, Doug Gregan, contact right. Newton Brothers Fellowship. That's right. If you, if you are, are looking for an opportunity to serve men or, or uh, get, be in relationship and, and serve uh, and support men or women coming out of jail, please contact us. Um, you know, th- there's m- numerous opportunities to support those guys. Excellent. Well, Doug, we're, we're coming to the end of our time here, but I, I would imagine that uh, some of our wa- viewing audience here are guys, men and women, um, uh, who have been in prison, or maybe even recently out of prison, or like you said, uh, particularly spouses who have been affected by this, by having a, a husband who's in prison, uh, or maybe struggling right now with, with what, what kind of life they want to live, whether they want to go back to this, yeah. um, and uh, maybe they were affected a little bit in, in, in prison, reading the scriptures. Um, if you want to just address uh, the, the viewing audience, what would you say to them? What kind of hope would you give them? Well, f- first of all, I guess I would say that um, you have to be confident that nothing is impossible for God. So I think of women who are just battling with a man who confesses one thing and is living another. Turn to the Lord. Trust God. And, of course, I would encourage you to communicate and and get connected to New Beginnings for Women. Um, We meet in Haverhill every Thursday. They meet in Haverhill every Thursday, 7 o'clock at uh, New Life Christian Assembly. Hopefully that information will be shared with you on the screen, so you'll be able to get that. Um, Men as well. Guys, you need to stay connected to the body of Christ. One of the cool things, Rick, that is consistent about New Brothers, we just sent out our latest newsletter, and Caroline wrote a wonderful piece about the fact that a man who stays connected to the body of Christ will not go back to jail. doesn't mean they won't struggle. doesn't mean they won't stumble. But they won't end up, re- they won't end up back inside. So, guys, I wanna, you got to get a vision for your life. Get a vision for who Christ is and, and the victory that he can bring you into. Nothing is impossible for God. So, I, I, you know, hey, we, we would love to support uh, the discipleship group in, in Haverhill Thursday, uh, 7 o'clock, First Baptist Church. So please come join us there, you know. Thank you, Doug. It's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome blessing to know that we have you in oh, Haverhill you. and we have you it's in this area ministering to guys. We're uh, kind of under the radar there. and that's okay, you yeah. know, it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's a great privilege to, to be engaged with the body of Christ, engage with your church and other local com- uh, church communities in Haverhill, man. Haverhill's got such a strong population, you know, strong body of Christ, strong body of pastors, leaders. So thank God for that. He's, God's doing a good thing here. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching Faith in Haverhill. It's been a blessing to lead the show and host the show. And it's been great to meet lots of folks in Haverhill, pastors and missionaries and chaplains and directors of ministries here in the area. Hope you join us next time. If you have any comments, any questions, feel free to contact uh, myself at rick at fbchaverill.org. Thanks for watching.